I don't know if I should share this or not, but this is one of my cornfields. Hi everyone, Matthew Cruz here at Comstock Investments. I'm gonna start again talking about weather. It's going into this week. I know large areas of the state of Iowa are heavily saturated. We've had really strong rains you know, just this weekend in the central Iowa region. We had four inches and that was kind of on top of already saturated soils. And so, you know, driving through central Iowa, it's pretty easy to find some water standing in some fields, you know, some streams and creeks that I've noticed that usually have a couple of feet of water in them are now kind of overrunning and kind of encroaching into neighboring fields. And so it's at the point now where we, we kind of need it to stop a little bit. And so, but I know most of the focus this week is a little bit on the heat levels that we see heat rising. And that's kind of to be expected to, to a certain extent, I think, in for this part of growing season, it, it's kind of surprising that we haven't Actually, I feel like it's been pretty modest up until this point. And that's what this graph kind of shows is that looking at the uh, stress degree days, which is one form of measurement to kind of say, okay, how, how stressful has it been on the crops based off of heat? And so it's pretty much days that are above 86 degrees is kind of the base point. And so you kind of see here that, you know, it's maybe above average, but it's not anything out of the ordinary, I guess. It's, you know, one would be the hottest in terms of the highest number of stress degree days, according to this. And so, yeah, I think Eric Snodgrass has pointed out that it's probably a little bit worse in uh, some of the uh, the Eastern Corn Belt where their evening temperatures have been setting records, where it's been quite a bit hotter. And so the corn in those areas is not, you know, they like it to get down closer to 70 degrees because the corn needs kind of that cooling off or resting period in the evening. And it hasn't been getting enough of that. But, you know, the question is the market's kind of digesting how, how much yield could we potentially lose off of excessive heat. And it, it just kind of depends on how long this heat probably lasts. It looks like we're going to have several days of temperatures in the 90s in a lot of regions. But as long as it's contained to three to five days, I don't know that it's going to rob us of that much yield. Of course, it could last longer than that. Time will tell. But, you know, honestly, in some areas, I don't, it might even be more of, as a, of a positive. I just started out talking about how it's really wet in some areas and we need a break. We need things to stay warm to kind of, soak up, burn off some, some of this excessive moisture that we've been experiencing. And so I don't, not everyone will agree with that. That's fine. But I think some warm in our area, at least a lot of central and Western Iowa might do more good than harm, actually, in, in my opinion. But I know other areas that maybe haven't gotten as much rainfall probably wouldn't agree with that but looking ahead this is the rainfall here for this week basically going out through next sunday the 27th i mean you can still kind of see there's pretty heavy rainfall here in the northern regions of the corn belt kind of that central area of, of minnesota is going to catch most of it with over four inches you know you can see the southern part of iowa northern missouri and then here this kind of northern tier of illinois and indiana now, Indiana was where it's been really dry up until this point. And, you know, we've had reports of corn leaves rolling in those areas. You know, I talked to Eric Snodgrass here recently, and he might upset some Indiana growers. He he said, I really don't see quite what the issue is based off of the NDVI levels that he was looking at, which kind of is a gauge of, of the crop health, the amount of photosynthesis that those crops in that particular state are representing. And the state as a whole was still showing within the average range. Now, obviously, I think a lot of people would disagree with that. I'm just saying that based off NDVI levels, you know, it was still within the average range. Now, if he took the corn bell as a whole, it kind of blew out the range. It was well above average for the NDVI levels. But the point is that I think over the weekend or late last week, Indiana got some rain and now it's scheduled to get some more rain over two inches in this northern region, which I think was hurting the most. And so I'm sure there's probably been some yield loss there, but I think this will go a long way to kind of having some recovery for yield in those areas. And and I know this northern tier of Illinois was also hurting a little bit, and it looks like they're going to get another inch or almost two inches of rainfall as well. There's this strip here in the kind of northern tier of Iowa. It doesn't get much of anything. There are some pockets that might get half an inch, but honestly, I kind of look at that as a good thing. We, as I said, we could use a break from all the rain. It's been very wet. I think there's a little bit of yellowing in some of my soybean fields, so it kind of needs things to dry out for a little while. And so I kind of look at that as a good thing. And maybe even Nebraska here as well, they probably use a little break from some of that. Again, here's kind of the heat anomaly for going through the end of July. You kind of see this is the average temperature above average in you know most of these areas in the central corn belt at four to 
five degrees above average. I still think this part of Kansas is kind of going to get hit the worst, you know, six degrees, almost seven degrees in some areas there in the central part of Kansas. And so we always go through a period, right, where it gets real hot. I was reading yesterday that we're going to get in this corn sweat stage where we're constantly in this cloud of perspiration that the, the corn crop is so large that it it creates sweat and the, and the sweat creates more rainfall. And so we're in this perpetual cloud basically. And so that's the kind of the period that we're in right now. This is kind of the weather anomaly looking out long range through August. And again, it's still showing a drier trend, especially kind of centered here in Kansas and, and surrounding states. Now it doesn't mean that we're gonna go dry you know, but this is kind of the, basically like in, in Iowa, you're an inch below average. Now, that's probably a good thing because I just talked about we've been very, very wet. And so if we probably need it to pull back a little bit or it starts to hurt things the other way. And so I, I don't know if there's any alarm bells. You know, it looks like it is going to, the rainfall is going to start to slow down a little bit as we get you know, later into the season. But we're down to the point now where arguably three weeks, maybe four weeks of critical growing season left. And, you know, still at least the next week or two look pretty good. And so I think that's going to continue to weigh pretty heavily on the markets. I don't know if I should share this or not, but this is one of my cornfields. And I'm told that this has 300 bushel per acre yield potential. Now, I'm, I don't want to count my chickens before the hatch. You know, a lot of things can happen yet. Knock on wood. We are definitely going to need above average yields above our APHs if we're going to make any money this year because you know, prices are not cooperating right now. I think we do need to start look for next month's USDA August report for them to more than likely increase yield. Question will be how much. And we saw this last year where they they went from 181 to 183.1. So they increased it in August last year by 2.1 bushels per acre. Yes, obviously later in the year, or actually in January, they reversed course and decreased it down to that 179. 3 level, but I think we're actually sitting even better right now than we were last year at this time. And so I don't know why the USDA would not increase it. I think they probably will, in my opinion. The question is how much, and that's what the market and everyone is debating right now. I see people that uh, have a lot of knowledge and experience that are calling for yields above 185, you know, and they're kind of unabashedly even saying up to 190. We need to be prepared for 190. I'm still not there yet. I just have a hard time getting to that point. I do think the crop is getting larger and we're going to see a bigger number in, in the August report. Shifting gears here to Brazil a little bit, you know, they're in the middle of their Safrinha corn harvest. They did actually just make halfway point now. So they're on the back half of their second crop corn harvest in Brazil. They're still about two weeks behind schedule. It's not a, a huge problem for them, but it looks like they're going to need another 30 days to wrap up the harvest there. They're about 80% done in Mato Grosso, which is the biggest uh, corn production state by far in Brazil. Yields continue to, to perform well. A lot of the private estimates continue to increase as time goes on. And so I think we're going to see a lot of future competition from them in Brazil. You know, one thing I was reading recently is how U.S. corn prices in the United States and our Gulf are still competitive. We're seeing reports that China is still buying soybeans in Brazil at higher prices than the United States, which seems odd. Usually when we have the best price, they're still going to buy from us despite some of this trade turmoil. So that's kind of alarming and I'm not sure what that means if they're kind of sending a message to American farmers that they're not going to buy from us anymore no matter what just because of the trade relations have fallen apart but that's something that we're eagerly anticipating is a trade deal from China and I think that's something that we really need to happen for the market mindset to kind of shift from uh, bearish to, to bullish and we need them to become big buyers again so the market is always looking for any tidbits of information about it gets excited just if Trump and President Xi have a phone call uh, or that they're going to talk and you know just that the communication is still open we think what needs to happen is Trump is probably going to have to go to Beijing which isn't a good look but if we're going to get a deal done he's probably going to have to go there but the problem is he doesn't have any visits slated there until late fall at the earliest so we're talking november 1st and then even then it takes some time and so crossing our fingers but it doesn't look like we're going to get any help there yet but uh, eventually we're hoping that something there will happen you know last week i talked about the president trump's new 50 percent tariffs on brazil a lot of countries are in the same boat right now where 
a lot of those tariffs are being executed here starting in August, some August 1st, uh, some August 12th. Brazil starts August 1st. And you know, overall, I think there, you know, there's a lot of reason why that's not good, that I think a lot of those costs will be passed on to you as consumers. But there is one silver lining is that you know, Brazil has had an 18% tariff on any ethanol imports into their country. And ethanol it makes up is a much bigger deal in Brazil. You know, it's primarily still comes from sugarcane and sugarcane is, you know, part of the Brazilian national identity. It's been grown in Brazil since it's been colonized over 450 years ago. You can kind of see here that US ethanol exports used to be a little bit bigger thing. You know, they topped out at half a billion gallons in 2018 that the US ethanol exported to Brazil. It was about 2017 when they enacted this 18% tariff on, on U.S. ethanol. And, and since then, it's those, of course, exports to Brazil collapsed. Now, ethanol production since then in Brazil is changed dramatically where corn ethanol is now becoming a big thing and is growing. And so I don't know that there's much of a market for U.S. ethanol in Brazil, it, just because the, it's changed there so much. I don't know that it makes a lot of business sense for the number one U.S. ethanol producer to want to sell it to the world's number two ethanol producer. I think there's there's a big world out there and you know they are our biggest competitor. It doesn't hurt to try. Probably the biggest thing is it will do is protect us, the United States, from Brazil ethanol exports to the United States and kind of protect the sustainable aviation fuel market, which is still very much in its infancy. You know, I don't know that there's a whole lot to protect right now, but that's been our concern is that unless we set up the right parameters and, and rules for sustainable aviation fuel production, you know, Brazil is set up and ready to kind of feed that market. And so that was our concern is that Brazil is going to supply the, the U.S. SAF market for a while until we kind of got our act together, which I'd much rather prefer that to happen. At least in the meantime, I, you know, as long as we have these tariffs, you know, they're not going to be able to afford to send us that fuel anymore. This is a chart from Bloomberg. You know, I think there's kind of an assumption that, okay, we're going to apply these tariffs and we're going to raise all this money. Well, that's kind of assuming that the amount of trade volume remains the same, that the number of containers and shipments remain the same. And that's not going to be the case. And this chart kind of reflects that. It's basically showing that through here, March, April, May, when these tariffs started to become enacted, that the shipments to the West Coast, specifically Los Angeles, dropped quite a bit. And you know, they spiked there in June because the tariffs got postponed. And so then there was a kind of a massive rush to, okay, let's do this again. Let's bring these containers back in to the West Coast. And now they're dropping off again. And so some of these analysts have pointed out that just in this short amount of time, container volume has already dropped 8% and they kind of expect it to drop more. They expect it to drop actually by as much as 25%. And just to put that into dollar value perspective for you, you're talking about half a trillion dollars in that 25% reduction. You know, that's obviously left less tariff money. If that's the goal is we're going to bring the, sh the shipments in and we're going to tariff it all here. Well, you're not getting as much tariff money if there's less trade uh, and the number of shipments drop, obviously. And I think that's the, the outlier that it's really hard to kind of predict is because, okay, we can raise these prices on importers or consumers, but it doesn't mean a lot of them are going to reject it. Consumers maybe can't afford it or, or the importers can't afford it. They're going to find alternative logistics. And so just something I wanted people to be aware of that is happening, that, that shipments are dropping. And, and I think as long as these tariffs aren't acted, you're going to can see that continue to drop. That's all I have for you today. Please sign up for a free trial to the Comstock Report. It's free here for the first couple of weeks, and we have a lot more specific trade ideas and recommendations and marketing crop information. Thank you and have a good day. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.